welcome to today's lecture on the Greco-Roman and Egyptian city of Alexandria. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we'll continue our place-based deep dive into the most important sites in all of ancient Egypt. Alexandria is a particularly interesting case because of its recent sudden rise. Within a couple hundred years, it was one of the most important cities in the entire Mediterranean. Surpassing these deep historical cities like Memphis in Egypt or Athens in Greece, that it had a far more illustrious and deep history. It's also fascinating because of the cosmopolitan nature of the city. As a port at the juncture of the Nile and the Mediterranean, it brought together people and ideas from all over the known world. So whether you're looking to find a good book, or a papyrus in this instance, or whether you'd prefer to bask in the glow of a great lighthouse, journey with me as we investigate Alexandria, Jewel of the Mediterranean. Most of the cities we've talked about in this class have long, illustrious histories. Memphis was the capital of Old Kingdom Egypt. Thebes thrived as the city of the cult of Amun, going all the way back to the Middle Kingdom. Near Eastern sites like Byblos and Kadesh have Bronze Age legacies. And the most important sites in the classical world, Rome and Italy and Athens and Greece, all go well back into the first half of the first millennium BCE. This makes it seem strange that Alexandria, one of the most important sites of the Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine worlds, is just an infant compared to its ancient neighbors. Alexandria, as the name suggests, was founded by Alexander the Great on his brief foray into Egypt in 332 BCE. But Alexander would never see just how great the city would become. He died without ever coming back to Alexandria. Well, at least he never came back to Alexandria alive. But after dying in Babylon in 323 BCE, his general Ptolemy stole his body, brought it to Egypt, and formally buried Alexander. And at least in Ptolemy's eyes, demonstrating that he was indeed the rightful successor to Alexander. Shortly after his burial in Memphis, his body and tomb were moved to his own city, Alexandria. Alexandria was built upon the small Egyptian town of Rakotis, which has its origins all the way back in the New Kingdom. This town would leave its name to the primarily Egyptian district of Alexandria. But for the most part, Alexandria was built entirely new according to Hellenistic city planning ideals. This allowed for monumental construction on a level that just wasn't possible in old, dense, crowded cities that had slowly expanded over the centuries. So we get the Heptastadion built by Ptolemy I, a nearly mile-long causeway that connected Alexandria to the neighboring island of Pharos, which provided a nice sheltered harbor for ships coming into the city. And we get the famous lighthouse at Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, started right around the same time. We get the Museon, the Institute of the Muses, which included the Great Library, built by his successor, Ptolemy II. And we get a massive Serapeum, a temple to Serapis, the new mixed Greco-Egyptian god of abundance and resurrection, in the southwestern part of the city, built by Ptolemy III. Mm -hmm. 
The Hellenistic period, from the death of Alexander in 323 BCE to the conquest of Rome in 31 BCE, was a time of cultural mixing. The term itself, which means Greekish or Greek-esque, stems from the idea that Greek rulers were in charge of very non-Greek places. And there was significant mixing and hybridization of people and institutions and cultural practices between the Greek aristocracy and the local commoners. And we've seen how the Ptolemies, in particular, have used strategies like depicting themselves as traditional pharaohs to secure their power over the native Egyptian population. Perhaps nowhere is this cultural mixing better attested than at Alexandria. It was home to three distinct ethnic communities, the ruling Greeks, the native Egyptians, and a really large Jewish population as well. In fact, the first Greek translation of the Biblical Old Testament, known as the Septuagint, was written in Alexandria. At first, these communities were kept apart in separate districts. But as time went on, there was more and more merging of the different populations of the city. Often, the merging and mixing between ethnic populations was a violent affair. First, we have the full-fledged revolt by Thebes against the Ptolemaic rulers of Alexandria, a conflict which lasted a full 20 years. We also get intense battles between the Ptolemies themselves, with Ptolemy X exiling his older brother Ptolemy IX. And later we see that during the reign of Cleopatra, the city of Alexandria was split between her supporters and those of her brother and husband, Ptolemy XIII. Later, under Roman rule, there were massive riots between Jewish and Greek populations in 38 and 66 CE. And in the early 2nd century CE, much of the city was destroyed by a third rebellion of Alexandria's Jewish population. Despite these uprisings, Alexandria's reputation as a diverse cosmopolitan city was certainly well earned. And its commitment to intellectual diversity and development paralleled that of the cultural realm. Alexandria saw such luminaries as Euclid and Archimedes teach there. And the famous engineer Hero lived in Alexandria, developing such awesome things as the world's first vending machine. Makes me wonder whether they that thing like served cans of wine. If so, he was a hero indeed. The intellectual developments of Alexandria can't be discussed without its crowning achievement, the Great Library. What we know today as the Great Library of Alexandria was most likely the construction of the second Ptolemaic king, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, right at the beginning of the 3rd century BCE. It wasn't a standalone structure, however. Instead, it was part of the Museon, very literally, the place of the muses, and the word that gives us our English word, museum. Instead of being a collection of texts or artifacts, however, the ancient Museon of Alexandria celebrated all the muses, being a place of music and poetry, of philosophy and anatomy and astronomy, and of course, literature. Now, the sheer scale and variety of texts is really what made this place stand out from all the other libraries. And there were a lot of those too, like this one from Ephesus, and then this one from uh, Athens. It's thought that the Great Library at Alexandria held hundreds of thousands of books on papyrus scrolls. And they got that many because the Ptolemaic rulers were aggressive collectors. The rule was that any ship that came into the port at Alexandria had to hand over any manuscripts that the Great Library didn't already have. Then they'd have to wait a while while a scribe copied the entire manuscript so a copy could be kept in the library and a copy sent back with the ship. An effective, if a little bit forceful, collecting strategy. Like we mentioned earlier, it wasn't just the scrolls that made the library famous. It was also all the famous scholars who came to work there. People like Eratosthenes of Cyrene, 
who worked and studied there while making his calculations of the circumference of the Earth. Yeah, that's right. We used to know that the world was round, and then we forgot that, and we thought it was square for a while, and then we discovered it was round again. And amazingly, Eratosthenes was basically right. Within a couple hundred kilometers of what we now know to be 40,075 kilometers in circumference. Pretty impressive if I do say so myself, Eratosthenes. Now, it's commonly thought that the Great Library burned down in a great fire, destroying massive amounts of the world's knowledge in one fell swoop. But that's not really what happened. Now, sure, a lot of the library did indeed burn during the civil war between Cleopatra and Caesar and her brother-husband, Ptolemy XIII. But it was rebuilt, and it stayed in use for centuries longer. Like many things nowadays, it declined due to a lack of funding in the Roman period, and eventually it was destroyed for good sometime in the 3rd or 4th century CE. We just saw that the way the Great Library got so great was by co-opting the papyrus scrolls of incoming ships. Alexandria was more than an intellectual center. It was a hotbed of economic activity, a trading port of any commercial ship traveling through the Nile. One of the first major construction projects of the Ptolemies was to turn Alexandria into an ideal port. Ptolemy I started a giant causeway from Alexandria to the nearby island of Pharos. Known as the Heptastadion, which literally translates as the Seven Stadia, and a stadion was a length of a sprint in the ancient Olympics. This causeway was nearly a mile long, and it provided a safe haven for ships docking to trade their wares. Then, of course, there was the Lighthouse of Alexandria, built right around the same time. It was an absolutely massive structure, more than 300 feet high, and it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world because of its incredible height. Equally as incredible is just how long the lighthouse lasted. It was built around 300 BCE, and it took only a mere 12 years to construct. The lighthouse stayed in use throughout the 300-year-long Ptolemaic rule, throughout the 400-year-long Roman rule, and for centuries during the Arab Muslim rule of the Middle Ages. The lighthouse withstood at least five major earthquakes in the Middle Ages. In 796, in 951, in 956, in 1303, and in 1323, finally disappearing when the Sultan of Egypt built a fort over what remained of the lighthouse. It wasn't until the 20th century that archaeological remains of the lighthouse were found during underwater excavations, and Egypt is currently in the process of turning the area into an underwater archaeological museum. So definitely go check that out if you're scuba certified. One of the coolest things, however, is that we actually have a pretty good sense for what this thing looked like in antiquity. Writers talk about having three tiers, square base, an octagonal middle, and a circular top. And this seems to be confirmed on artifacts like this Roman coin of the second century CE. And then on this mosaic from the fourth century in Libya, well, that shows the multiple tiers in the bronze statue, either of Poseidon or Zeus sitting atop the structure. But perhaps most revealing is the monumental tomb from Abu Sir, a site in Egypt, just west of Alexandria. It dates to about the same time as the construction of the lighthouse, and archaeologists think it was modeled directly on it, with the square base, octagonal middle, and circular top. Pretty cool to have a miniature, but still monumental lighthouse still standing today. The power and importance of the city of Alexandria transcended many of the major political periods and regimes that ruled over it. It outlasted the Ptolemies, and was one of the most important cities of the Roman Empire. And it outlasted the Romans, and was one of the most important cities of the Byzantine Empire. 
and it outlasted the Byzantines and was one of the most important cities of Arab rule during the Middle Ages. But let's backtrack a second from there and focus on its role in late antiquity, the time when the Roman Empire fell in the west and the Byzantine Empire rose in the east, gaining control over Egypt. During this time, as the Christian Byzantine Empire rose to power at the site of Constantinople in modern-day Turkey, Alexandria continued to play a prominent role in the eastern Mediterranean world. This was, in large part, because of its crucial connection to early Christianity. Alexandria was one of the five seats of the Archbishop, along with Rome, where he was called the Pope, and Antioch, Constantinople, and Jerusalem, with Alexandria being the fifth one there. Egypt was particularly known as the center of Arianism, which is very different than what it sounds like. We're not talking early 20th century Germany here. Instead, Arius was a monk around 300 CE who taught that Jesus was the son of God and therefore subordinate to God, rather than being equal and eternal like God. Now, this might seem to you like minor nitpicking, but it was a huge deal in the early Christian world necessitating all sorts of ecumenical councils to figure out what set of beliefs the early Christian church should actually promote. Sometimes monks would just wander out into the desert to isolate themselves for a couple of decades at a time. It was an intensely religious place. Christianity also led to a break with many traditions of the pagan past that had been maintained by earlier Ptolemaic and Roman rulers. So for example, around 400 CE, the Roman Emperor Theodosius I ordered that all the pagan temples in the city should be destroyed. But within a couple centuries, the new threat wasn't pagan temples, but rather the followers of Allah and Muhammad. The middle of the 600 CE, the Christian Byzantine Empire and the Muslim Arab populations clashed, and in 646, Egypt fell to the Arabs, ending nearly a millennium of Greco-Roman rule. Now, fun fact here, the evangelist Mark, the guy who wrote one of the Gospels, was supposedly buried in Alexandria. And pirates in the 800 CE, they stole his body from his tomb in Alexandria, took it to Venice, and that's why we have the Cathedral of San Marco in Venice today. Pretty cool. The history of Alexandria is just as diverse as the people who lived there. From the earliest days, Greeks and Egyptians and Jews mixed together. And over the course of centuries, it was ruled by Greeks and Romans and Christian Byzantine emperors and Arab Muslim sultans. Along the way, it became a massive center for trade with the lighthouse of Pharos and the intellectual development at places like the Great Library. The city of Alexandria still survives in Egypt today, and some of its archaeological remains, like the lighthouse, are beginning to be unearthed. But it will always remain a testament to the exchange of ideas, practices, and cultures that exemplified life in Greco-Roman Egypt. Just a couple lessons you can learn from Alexandria, Jewel of the Mediterranean.